How y'all doing? It's 6.20. I've got an hour and 20 minute message. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Yeah, we failed to pray for the children this morning, Pastor Jeff. Thanks for remembering that tonight. Are we sending this on the wide world web? World wide web? Charlotte's web? What are we sending it on? Everything. Turn to 1 Corinthians 7. This is a teaching, okay? And you're going to learn some stuff that you didn't learn. Who have I consulted on this chapter? I've consulted the General Counsel of the Assemblies of God, Doug Clay. I've consulted Dr. Wade Nunley. I've consulted Pastor Raymond Wheats. And I've consulted my daughter. You know, don't be laughing. She's smarter than me because she got her mother's brain. Now her mother can't think clear because my wife doesn't have a brain because my daughter got it all. But uh, no, actually, you don't lose your brain when you give your brain. You just, she just got her brain, so my daughter is real smart. And so she was able to pull things out of this text that I'd have never thought of uh, from a young person and from a female point of view. So I hope you learn something, and I pray God will help me be able to teach. So the title of the message, I remember when, when uh, Jared over here, Reverend Atchison, Jared boy, was doing a, serm, uh, a sermon at a wedding, and he started it off, Mowage, and that's the title. And I don't know what that's from exactly. I think it's from a movie, Mowage. And so that's the title. And three simple thoughts. One is, the first thought is uh, mating matters. The second thought is marriage matters. And the third part is ministry matters. And that's how this is broken down. It's very clear to see. And Paul says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now I'm in the, this, okay, so look. NIV's up there, and I got the NASB. Is anybody bothered by that? Are y'all intelligent enough to read the screen and listen to the difference in ASB? Are you okay with that? Are you with me? Okay, don't let it bother you. This is just a different version. It says the same thing, okay? All right. Don't get all bent out of shape over it. All right. By the way, how many, if you got a suit on, stand up. Okay, I just thought I'd point that out. All right, here we go. Who's the, who's the best dressed dude in the house? Larry. Who? Larry who? David, stand up. Let me see you. Okay, you just sit there. You know what? I know you're a lot older than you look, even though you've got that beautiful hair. I don't like it, but I, I, I want it. I want it. I'm, 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 I'm desirous of it. You, you're a handsome man, Larry, I'll tell you that. That Pat, she's a lucky woman, I'll tell you. All right, so... Concerning the things about which he wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, but because of immoralities, each man is to have his own wife and each woman is to have her own husband. The husband must fulfill his duty to his wife and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body. Don't misunderstand that verse. I will talk about it in a minute. But the husband does and likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time so that you may devote yourself to prayer and come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But this I say by a way of concession, not of command, yet I wish that all men were even as I myself am. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. Uh, Verse number eight, but I say to the unmarried and to the widows that it is good for them if they remain even as I, but if they do not have self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. All right, that's verse one through eight. That's the first part of mating marriage. And when I talk about mating, we'll go to Genesis. It's good, it says, to go populate the earth, right? Right? Okay. Okay. And so having kids is a good thing. However, some people, uh, for whatever reason, you can't like condemn someone who doesn't have kids. Maybe their calling is not to have kids. And in this also, Paul makes it clear the value of, of being single. And a lot of times we, we, uh, we devalue a, a woman or a man that never marries or that is single 
uh, in their life, or maybe they did, but their, their spouse died, they remained single, or something happened and the, the marriage ended and they remained single. Listen, your value is not in your marital status, okay? Your worth is not in your marital, marital status. You should not uh, think of yourself or pity someone as if there's something wrong or they are missing out or whatever else because singleness is whole. And everyone that would be married should be whole to begin with. And Paul here actually elevates the ability to stay uh, in that position. And later when we talk about marriage mat ministry matters, it's because of being able to give his full attention to ministry. And that's where he's coming from. Now, I personally believe that uh, Paul's wife left him when he became a believer. I believe Paul was married. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. The, in writings, we see that in the Sanhedrin that uh, you had to be married to be in the Sanhedrin. And, and uh, so he was in the Sanhedrin, and yet in his letters, when he starts writing these, these letters, you see he's not married. So I believe, I believe, uh, and, and, and somebody correct me because I'll stand up on Sunday morning and correct this, but I believe there's reason to think, though we don't know, that, that, uh, uh, that his wife left him. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if, if, uh, if that's true or not. I, I'm not going to say for sure. But correct me, uh, in, you've got a couple of theologians, three right in here. Uh, it, was it true that to be a part of the Sanhedrin you had to be married? Yes, I'm getting nods, yes. So something happened. She could have died. We don't know for sure. But, uh, but he addresses it in such a way that I, I have a concern uh, that possibly that, that would be the case. So in here you see uh, that, that uh, being with a woman is not wrong and to fulfill the desire, what would be wrong to be immoral about it. And, um, and let me just say this. Morality is important. And, and the first part of this is talking about the importance of morality to go ahead and marry and not burn. And, and honestly, I, I've got uh, on, my, on my phone here, I have a, a statement uh, from, from, you know, how the liberal churches are. I have a statement on their marriage uh, policy that, that uh, basically says this uh, on their same gender wedding policy. Uh, as a Bible-based church, we stand firmly against the oppression and bullying of LGBTQ people, and I don't believe in, in bullying anybody, and I agree with that. I don't know what they mean by oppression exactly. I, I may be misunderstand. Too often carried out by self-righteous and legalistic Christians. I take, I take offense at that statement that while that may be true that some are like that that actually do the bullying, that uh, the world says if you stand up for biblical marriage, and notice that here in this first part of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 7 that I'm reading from, it's totally referring to a man and a woman, and that's the, one of the things we see here confirmed and throughout the teaching of Paul, and, uh, and yet uh, so many times if you stand up, you get attacked and, and accused of being some uh, mean Christian when you stand up for right and wrong. Now, if your attitude and your approach is ugly and mean about it, then no, that's not okay. You don't, you don't insult people. You teach them what the Word says, and you leave it there. So there was a time years ago when I was preaching, and I was talking about morality, and I mentioned, I mentioned this, and, and, I, and I had, I had I later the Holy Spirit really convicted me because I said something to the effect, and and, and, you know, passionately, somewhat passionately, that God didn't make, uh, uh, he, he made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And the Holy Spirit convicted me how insulting that was and accusational that was and, and how making people laugh at that is mean because they're, they're going to reject you, people reject you when you teach that way. And I was wrong, and the Holy Spirit convicted me. That's not like anybody should ever talk like that or act like that. And I say that because be careful. Be careful because all morality is important to God. And we have people that are raised in this church by Christian parents that their kids, they move out and they move in with their girlfriend before they get married and then get married. And that's immoral immorality too. That is wrong. It is wrong to partake of and enjoy the pleasures of your eyes in pornography. It is wrong that within marriage 
to step outside of that. It is wrong for teenagers to experience this because God said uh, that you're to have one man and one woman. Why? Because the moment of pleasure, as I said last week, is addictive. It's 40 times more addictive, at least 40 times more addictive than heroin because dopamine is released and dopamine is 40 times more addictive than heroin. That's why did God make it addictive? Because he wanted it addicted to your spouse Then when you thought pleasure, you thought your spouse. And that if that's never uh, it, it compromised before you're married, that you never water down the bonding. You're bonded as one flesh, and you don't water that down when you get married. When you think pleasure, you think her. You think him, and that's the one. And then you're addicted to that person, and you love, and there's a bond that's really strong when you keep that pure. How many understand what I'm saying? But I, I, what, I'm, what I'm telling you is I want to make it plain that all morality matters to God. But listen as I go on reading uh, uh, from this church's website about their same gender wedding policy. It says, uh, it says the, the, they're firmly against the oppression and bullying, bullying of LGBTQ people too often carried out by self-righteous and legalistic Christians. And I know that that can be true, but there's other people too that aren't Christians that, that are hateful. And, and such behavior is outrageously unfaithful and gross misrepresentation of Christ's love Jesus calls our love for God and, uh, and others his greatest commandment. That's true. And it goes on, without hesitation, then names the church, loves and welcomes all people straight and gay. And we love and welcome anybody of all kinds of moral sins, no matter what it is. And this is same sex, so that's in, I understand why they put that. I have no problem. But here's where I draw the line. They go on and say, we are blessed by the large number of LGBTQ people who proudly call blank their church home, actively taking part in the life and mission of this congregation. Is that a problem? It's a problem. Let me reread it and change their word. We are blessed by the large number of adulterers who proudly call blank their church home, actively taking part in the life and mission of this congregation. You like that? I'm just telling you, that's not okay no matter who it is, is it? Is it okay? No. As I said last Sunday morning, Paul was, Paul was offended when, when, when Paul was uh, telling the Corinthians that this man had been sleeping with his father's wife and the church was puffed up instead of mourning and groaning about it. They're puffed up. What are they puffed up about? We're so proud we're inclusive. We're so proud we're so loving. We're so proud that we're so accepting. We're so proud of, of who we are. And Paul says, wait a minute, this is not person that's lost. This is not sinners in the world. Sure you love them. Sure you go after them. Sure you take them right where they are. These are people that are known as a public sin known in the congregation, and you're not dealing with it, and I've already figured it out and told you it's wrong. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? All right. So that is, that's not okay, and yet that's 80% of the churches in America right there. That's 80% of the churches in America, and that's definitely our youth culture. It's not okay. It's biblically wrong. People that call themselves Christians, a church gathering is primarily to a, 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 gather, a, a gathering of believers, a fellowship of believers, and, and to be taught and built up, yes, to reach people. And you need to be sensitive to that. But, but just let me, let me just tell you this. It's really important that we understand that when someone is a part of our fellowship and they're, and they're representing our church, that they be confronted. And I will tell you that privately and lovingly and confidentially, that has happened. And, and uh, I, I've run people off in that. But I've had other people come that I know aren't believers, and they come, and I know, I can tell that, that they have a lifestyle of sin. I know, if I talk to them, and I don't condemn them. I don't judge them. I don't immediately confront that. I just let the word do its work because the first thing that has to happen for their eyes to be open is to be saved. So you surely don't treat them the same as you do someone that you know that knows better and knows the word that claims to be a Christian and that openly rebels against God's word. Are you with me? Okay, not, not being mean at all. So I hope New Hope 
never does that. I hope we never put our name in that in no matter what happens because I'll tell you, I, I, I was reading um, some um, English news, um, a person that is a great, when the great revival and awakening happened in England, one of the, one of the guys was talking and it was going, it's better to be persecuted for doing what's right than avoiding persecution uh, because you're afraid to do what's right. And I will tell you that it's going to be more and more to stand up for biblical morality that we're going to be attacked in many ways. You know, there'll, there'll be a day when I speak what I just spoke, I'd go to jail for that. It's coming. Our nation is moving that way. Get ready. It's happening. So we'll find out where we stand on it. So how about this wife not having authority over her own body? Does that mean that the husband can force himself and make him and owns her and anytime he says? Absolutely not. You see twin verses over in 1 Peter 3 and it talks about treating each other as a brother. And too many men have the idea that she's my possession. I can do what I want with her. There's a word for that that I won't bring up. But just because you're married doesn't mean you can make a person do something. It has to be in a cooperative thing. All it's talking about is the heart and attitude. You, are you with me? Okay, so that's one area that's really important you understand. Another area is that, uh, is that uh, uh, how important this, this subject is to, for Paul to bring it up because he talks about the sin that can come from having desires. And he's going, you know, a big part of being married is to fulfill desires. That's what he's saying. He's, do, you, do you see that? Else, why is he bringing this up? He's going, hey, you know what? Unless you're separating for a time of prayer and so, so that Satan can't attack you, then, then you make sure that you, you stay uh, uh, in communication with each other in a physical way. And, uh, and Paul says, you know, he has a discipline and a gift to not have to be there. But, you know, not everybody is gifted that way. And he ends that in seven. And, uh, and he, then he says, you know, hey, I'm obviously saying I'm single. I'm saying to the unmarried and the widows, it's good for them if they remain that, verse eight and nine. But if they don't have self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So the first thing I, I would just say, marriage is a good thing. If it's done right, it's a good thing. And here's, here's something we've taught in the church, which brings up the next thing. Marriage matters. Uh, uh, and the next thing is uh, uh, mating matters is what we're talking about, being together, mating. And the second thing is marriage matters, is marriage has to be right. One of the things is that the Christian church has done wrong is we have said to people that no matter what's going on, you got to stay in the marriage unless there's unless there's uh, adultery, unless there's infidelity. How many have been taught that? Now, that's not right. And uh, in fact, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the guy that did, uh, uh, he'd been on the radio through the Bible or, uh, no, not J. Vernon McGee, the other guy, I can't think of, I can't think of the name of the guy. And he said there's three reasons why, why a person can, 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 be, can be broken up. I'll, I'll find that out. I, I, I had it in my head and I didn't think I'd forget it, but I'm old. Uh, and that is adultery. Two, uh, abandonment, which includes emotional. It includes abusiveness. It includes... Uh, uh, leaving and, and also addictions, three A words. Adultery, abandonment, and addiction. And uh, in, in abandonment, he says, or, you know, he includes when he talks about it, um, abuse. So let me ask you, fathers and grandfathers, if your daughter is being verbally abused and threatened and physically abused, and your, or your daughter's husband steps out on you and has an affair, and the guy is sorry and says he won't do it again, which one do you want to send your daughter back into? To forgive them for infidelity? Or do you want to send them back into a situation where there's verbal threats and abuse and are physical? 
See, the next passage talks about somebody leaving. And everybody that I mentioned earlier, and my daughter not being an expert, but Dr. Nunley, in fact, the general counsel right now, the Assemblies of God, the headquarters, is changing. And the quote from Doug Clay was this, who's our head guy. He said, before we have a corpse, we're going to change what the approval is of a divorce and remarried as a minister. Because ministers are staying in abusive relationships because not wanting to shame the church, being afraid of losing their ministry, their credentials, feeling ashamed themselves, and feeling quiet and trapped, and people are being hurt, and we're going to have a corpse if we don't change it. And right now, they're changing to add that as one of the reasons. And uh, Dr. Nunley separately told me that exact same thing, that the unbelieving husband leaving or the unbelieving wife leaving is not physically leaving because what if I'm abusive and I just physically don't leave but I stand there and I verbally abuse you and I threaten you and I control you with words to where you're so afraid you do everything I, I tell you to do and you're a slave in the home how many of you you've seen it I have my first cousin's daughter that was treated that way and he ended up, he was so abusive, he put a bullet right in his head. And it, I was at the, the, the uh, trial a year ago or less, and he's in prison forever. And her dad tried to get him out of it, but she had a Christian church background that says without infidelity. And yet she somehow was so blinded that she was trying to be faithful, trying to be loyal, trying to stay in there. And he would beat the tar out of her. The witnesses, he would beat her underneath. But before that, it was all verbal control. Verbal leads to physical. And abuse people abuse people. So I'm telling you right now that this passage, when it talks about the, 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 the believing or the unbelieving spouse we're talking about leaving. We're not talking about physically leaving. We're talking about leaving or abandoning the vows, abandoning the Christian bond of how a husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church and that the wife show due respect and honor to her husband and, and, be, and, and be in cooperation as spiritually one. So here it goes, verse, uh, verse number 9, uh, verse number 10. But to the married, here is the marriage matters. To the married I give instructions, not I but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and that the husband should not divorce his wife. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife, who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. This is whether they're a believer or not, not how they're behaving. Not how they're behaving. Let me tell you, love can be killed. Words, words are destructive. You can murder a person with words. You can destroy them to where love is no longer can be there and trust. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. That's a, a very difficult thing, but let me just say it this way. What he's saying is, with the wife being there and being an example, that, that, that in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, it talks about by the behavior of the wife, an unbelieving husband can be brought, brought about and changed. But it, nowhere does it say that the wife should should stay there and take abuse and stay in, in that kind of behavior. It's, it's that if he's unbelieving, and we have people in our church that w the husband is an unbeliever and the wife is an unbeliever. Some men come, their wives don't. We have that. And we have others that the husband doesn't come and the wife comes. And they stay there, and I encourage it. But if they're being abusive and threatening and harming, in whether it's words or physical, that's not okay, and this doesn't, this doesn't apply. This does not apply. Abandonment uh, is, is, uh, is, a, is, is a thing that a person shouldn't stay in that. And, and I, I want to free people that you don't have to sit there and be physically. Now, I'm not talking about if someone blows up and yells at you. I'm talking about a, a constant, continuous, verbal, or physical abuse. 
whether it's a woman to a man, and I've seen it, or a man to a woman. It's not okay. And it's not talking about them. We're talking about a, a believer uh, uh, sanctifying their husband and, our, and then their children. It talks about the next verse. Here, here's what Dr. Nunley says. Here's what I think. Here's what everyone I've talked to believes this. Is that, is that basically it, it, uh, it consecrates is the word. It's consecrating that family to give them a hope, to give, to give them a Christian foundation and that the influence is that strong. It's not talking about that the husband is saved. It's not talking about salvation because the wife stays and she's saved, so he's saved because she's saved. That's not what it's talking about. There's theology that says it, but that's not it. Nor, nor for the kids, because kids until the certain age. What it's talking about is the consecration of the family has a blessing behind it. So he says this, he says, um, he says also, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, verse 14, 14, through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Yet if believing one leaves, let him leave. The, the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. Uh, the brother or sister is not under bondage in such case, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband or how will you know, oh husband, whether you will save your wife? Obviously, he's saying they can both be in situations that are difficult, but he's not addressing that the only thing that makes you stay is the only thing that would approve you of leaving is infidelity. He's not saying that. Now, you all know common sense, but this has been taught wrong. And if you disagree with me, that's fine, but, but, but I believe the leaving is, is, is not physically leaving. Because I, if, I, if I say I want to abuse you, I can stay in that marriage and I don't physically leave and I can control you by abusing you, staying right there. And as long as I don't physically leave, you're, under, you're my slave because I'm, I'm going to verbally assault you. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Is that okay? It's not okay. It's not okay. So he says... Verse 16, for how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, a husband, whether you will save your wife? Let me, let me tell you that, uh, that in the language of the day, uh, uh, both the uh, Greco-Roman and the Jewish language, when they would write or talk, if there was one man and a hundred women in a room, they used the masculine term. So that's why a lot of people think the Bible is sexist because that was the culture of the day. Both the, 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 the uh, uh, Greco-Roman and the, the Jewish uh, custom of, of writing and speaking. So they'll say, well, they're saying he. They say he. They say he. When they're addressing, though, they're talking to men and women. So remember that. Because that, there's a lot of misunderstanding in Scripture when you read it because we don't know that very fact. Thank you, Dr. Nunley. Only as the Lord has assigned to each one, as God has called each one in this manner, let him walk. And so I direct all the churches, verse 17. Uh, was, any man, uh, was any man called when he was already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Is anyone called in uncircumcision? He is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but what matters is keeping of the commandments of God. Each man must remain in that condition in which he was called. While Were you called while a slave? Do not worry about it. But if you're able to also become free, rather do that. For he was called in the Lord was while a slave is the Lord's freed man, even though he may remain the same. Likewise, he who was called while free in Christ is Christ's slave. You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, each one is to remain with, in, with God in, in that condition in which he was called. Okay, so then he goes on and he, and he starts talking about ministry. But, but let, let, me, let me just make this, make this clear. That I am not saying that uh, we all will say things that can be construed that you got a little out. I'm talking about extreme cases of abuse. I'm not talking about little out clause, okay? Conflict. When you get angry, you say things you don't mean and that. I'm talking about when there's abuse, threatening to harm or kill, uh, uh, those, those types of levels of abuse. That is not okay. It's not okay. And Paul is by no means saying that you're, you're stuck. Sorry, you're stuck. He's not saying that. 
Then he says, though, verse 25, because not only does, does, a, does mating mar- matter and the fact that, that a person gets married for, for the purpose of, of fulfillment uh, in r- romance, but also marriage matters, and it's very important. And, it's, and the reason I brought the other up is because notice it's between a, a husband and a wife, a man and a woman in, within marriage, and, uh, and that he's obviously talking about unless it's within that, it's not okay. So you better marry if you can't control your passion. And in verse 25, he says, but ministry matters. Now, culturally, do you know that they did not have a high V or a target back then? Did you know how hard it was to provide food and to provide everything that they had to do? So when it talks about, and here again, here's the masculine, you'll see it. It's also for the female. Okay, so just in this context, just remember this, that both the man and the woman are included here, that he's saying it's better you remain single for the sake of ministry. Because then he says the man, or he, would have to provide for his wife and or his children, and it takes a lot of time away from ministry. So if you can constrain yourself, then give yourself to ministry. But he's not just saying that to men. Don't be... Don't be uh, male egomaniacs. He's saying it to women too because all throughout Scripture, women are in ministry. And he's saying, women, you can stay single for the sake of ministry too because there were women pastors in the New Testament and Old Testament prophet, uh, women that were prophets. And I, I, I hate the fact that people uh, put down females in ministry. It's wrong. It's been taught wrong. Evangelicals have taught so many things wrong, and that's another one of them. And so, again... Uh, here, uh, verse 25 to the end, you're going to see it's talking, uh, talking in such a way that you think it's only addressing the man, but it's talking to a female too. Look, now concerning virgins, I have no command of the Lord, but I give an opinion as who by the mercy of the Lord is trustworthy. I think then that is good in view of the present distress. And notice he says the present distress. There was a reason then he was saying it that he's not saying it for us today. So there was a reason then that maybe 50 years later he wouldn't say it. So notice some of the things that he says here was for that present time, whatever was going on, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Yet such will have trouble in this life, and I'm trying to spare you. (laughs) That's a funny verse. Uh, But verse 29, but this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none. In other words, there's work to be done. And so try to live that way. But let me tell you, it took a lot to make provision in those days. They lived in groups, families with sons and daughters-in-laws and the children. They all worked together to make it work because it was a lot of work just daily making the, the, the necessary preparations for living. Verse 30, and those who weep as though they do not weep. In other words, you don't have time for that. The time is short. We need to be about the ministry of the gospel, he's going to say. And those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. And those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use the, wor- use the world as though they did not make full use of it. For the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be free from concern. One who is unmarried is concerned about the things, is, uh, is concerned about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But one who is married is concerned about the, th- about the things of this world how he may please his wife. Notice he goes male on us there, but he's talking about the women too. And his interests are divided. The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and spirit. But one who is married is concerned, the woman that's married who is concerned about the, is con, uh, says is married is concerned about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. This I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. But if any man thinks that he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, if she is past her youth, and if it must be so, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin. Let her marry. But he who stands firm in his heart, being under no constraint, but has authority over his own will and has decided in his own heart to keep his own virgin daughter, he will do well. But then both 
he who gives his own virgin daughter in marriage does well, and he who does not give her in marriage will do better. A wife is bound as long as her husband lives, but if her husband is dead, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But in my opinion, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I also have the Spirit of God. And some women would say, amen, if your man dies, don't get remarried. I suppose. I don't know that because I'm not a female. But here's the point. He's saying there's an urgency, and if you're able to bear it, how much more can you do not ever being married? But use your time and your resource for the work of God. But here's something that I want, I want to correct in our culture, in that it doesn't take as much time to provide for family. It doesn't take as much time if we do it right as it did them. So we can still do ministry, and there's not, there's not an excuse here to go, I'm married, I've got kids, I don't have time to do anything ministry. That's not what this is saying. But ministry matters. Paul is saying if you're married or not married, ministry matters. It matters for you. It matters for your kids. And marriage matters. And, and being uh, pure within relationships, within a marriage matters. That's why mating matters. How you do it, it needs to be in a biblical confines. Are you with me? Are we okay? All right. So if today you heard that I'm saying there's any reason to break up a marriage, I didn't say that. If you said that your spouse got mad at you and blurted something, yelled at you something one time, and it's not a pattern, you're not, you're not being controlled, I didn't say that either. I'm saying extreme cases. I'm not giving permission in any way. And if you, if you disagree with me, I would like for you to talk to me instead of other people. But I, I, I feel strongly enough about it that, uh, that I, I, I know separately, I've checked with other theologians that agree with me, that leaving is not a physical leaving. So if a person says, well, I don't want to leave you, I want to be here. Yeah, you're going to keep abusing them. The trust is broken. And uh, it's too late. Sometimes it's too late. And particularly if there's abuse when the person won't admit it and ask forgiveness and get help and be honest about that abuse, that's not okay. Repentance has to happen, right? Are you with me? Raise your hand if you've been in an abusive relationship. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hi. Let me see it. Okay. Is that why you left? Yep. Yep. That's why you left? That's why you left? Okay. Over, anywhere over here? Yep. Okay. Yep. I remember you shared in your video. So, do we want a bunch of people running around believing the only reason ever there's a reason to break up a marriage is if the woman or the man stepped outside of the mar marriage in infidelity? Is that, is that even make sense? does not make sense. It's not biblical. And I want to set it straight because I want to take the frozen, stuck, stay in it, abused and abused and abused away from the mindset of people who are following God to honor God because it's just as honoring of God to get away from that as it is to sit there. And uh, here's one thing that I want to make clear. Only, you can't tell, I never tell anybody when it's time to get out, it's up to that person because God's grace will give them and God sometimes does a miracle. But God's grace will give that person the strength to stick in there even when someone else wouldn't and I've seen that work out. So a person has to hear from God and know the grace that God and no one else, and I've never done this to this day, I've never said you need to leave. I never said you should divorce that person, never. I've said, I have said that uh, adultery is not the only reason for divorce. I have said that, but I've never advised even one person to leave or to divorce another person. I've said there's something you have to do, only God knows is between you, and I can't tell you to do it. I'm not going to do that. I said, because you're the one going to answer to God and not me. I just know this, that when you divorce, you trade 
one set of problems for a new set of problems that are permanent. So the reason you divorce better be pretty important because I'm telling you, it doesn't go away. You got a new set of problems from that divorce that will probably always be there, especially if there's kids involved. And so it doesn't solve everything, but sometimes it's the only way out, only way to be safe, to be at peace, only way. Okay, are you with me? So adultery, abandonment, abuse, and uh, uh, what was the third, what was the third, the, 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 it was, a, I put abandonment and abuse together, it's a, uh, what? Addiction, yeah, that's another one. I mean, you're living with someone who's addicted and they, they come in and how they, how many of you heard stories and they stay addicted, they say at least separate, get away, give them a chance, wake them up, hopefully they change, but don't stay in an addictive relationship with someone that's addicted to drugs or alcohol that treats you like you're a piece of junk. Don't stay in that. I don't mean divorce them, but get away from them. Don't just live there. I've seen people beat and beat and beat, and it ruins the kids because of the way the, the spouse treats their other spouse, and they see that, and they learn disrespect for authority. It ruins your kids. Don't stay in that, okay? All right, if you're mad at me, let me know. Last week, I got a lot of compliments because I just walked off here and said, if you want to pray, come pray. So that's what I'm doing. Pastor Brett's going to come to the piano.